Okay, we are recording, and it is the 20th of June, I think, and 2018. And this uh, Zoom call is going to be on understanding histamine as we start to go through everybody's genetics. This is one piece that we go through, and it's one piece that we go through um, a little bit more in depth because histamine can be a feeder of cancer. So just to go over this again so we're all on the same page. I also want to remind you that um, um, when we're getting results back, like results back on your genetics or results back on your IV gene test, I have put presentations together for the IV gene. You'll have to go to the website and you'll have to click on the resources tab, which is on the top of the website next to the store tab on our website and on the resources tab you'll see all our blog posts the IV gene information on how to understand what the IV gene score means and such is on a blog post so search down there's a search bar on our blog now so you can search for IV gene and you'll come up with that but you can scroll down and you'll see that also when we go through your genetics I don't want to go through um, the tests blindly. I mean, I want you guys to know what we're looking at. It'll be helpful for you to understand. So when we go through your genetics, it is absolutely required that you watch some of the genetic videos. If you click on the genetics tab, the genes leave clues, I think is the tab name. Um, it will, on the bottom of that tab, you'll see um, some other links to genetic pages. And now, uh, the Cancer Genes book, which is a video book, uh, it's not a written book, it's a video book, is up on our website. On the bottom of that uh, Genes Lead Leave Clues tab, you'll see um, uh, Cancer Genes, the book. You can click on it. The book is a living book, meaning it's constantly being added to. I only have done the first three sections of it. There'll be multiple, multiple sections as time goes by. So we'll be constantly adding videos. The amount of time lapsed in the videos that are on there right now are multiple hours of videos. I know that you're not um, undergoing your care here, nor are you um, looking to get a PhD in, um, in uh, functional medicine and genetics. Uh, however, learning as much as you can can be very helpful. So um, at least watch some of those videos before we go over your genetics so you really understand what we're even looking at. It doesn't just all look great to you. So uh, some of you want to nerd out more, some of you don't. Usually the ones who want to nerd out more are on these calls. So we're going to just nerd out a little bit on histamine today. So histamine is important. So we hear about histamine because we see television commercials about antihistamines. And if you have a stuffy nose, a runny nose, seasonal allergies, um, can't sleep, take an antihistamine and it will decrease the histamines in your body so that you'll be able to um, breathe fully and, and get rid of seasonal allergies. And is that true? Well, it certainly can be. The problem with taking a drug antihistamine is it will uh, reduce histamines, but then you get a reflux secretion of more histamine and it's really not solving the problem. So even though I'm not against using antihistamines at different times, if you have a long-standing histamine problem, we want to address the reason that it's there and not just become dependent upon antihistamines that can have all sorts of other side effects that we aren't going to get into here. So histamine, what is it? What does it do? Um, it's uh, secreted in uh, the body and it does numerous different things. It's the biggest thing we think about histamine with histamine problems is the immune system because histamine acts as a vasodilator, so it increases the dilation of the vessels and allows your immune response to attack a substance. So what does your immune system do? Your immune system kills things that are, that are invading your body, like a virus or a bacteria. Um, 
or a fungus or a mold, some living organism, a biotoxin is what your immune system is supposed to attack. However, when things get into our body that are not supposed to be in our body, let's say we eat a food substance that gets across a damaged gut border and that food substance was supposed to be too big to get across a healthy gut, but because we have a damaged gut border, that food substance gets across and our immune system fires a reaction. We end up with histamine being secreted by these cells called mast cells in order to bring a, a more immediate immune response there. So histamine serves a purpose to aid the immune system. Um, well, that's a good thing. But the problem is, is that your immune system is only supposed to fire against biotoxins, living organisms. And when it's firing against things like foods or allergens that we are absorbing, that we shouldn't be getting into the bloodstream in the first place, we have this immune response to things that aren't even killable. So histamine continues to be upregulated, meaning it continues to be secreted by the body because of the fact that these things aren't being killed by the immune system. So an example would be, my damaged gut allows larger particles of proteins across its membrane into the bloodstream, and my immune system sees that as an enemy tries to kill it, and because it's just a peptide or a part of a protein, it doesn't die, so it's constantly ramped up and you got this constant histamine reaction where it's continually being secreted. In a healthy individual with a healthy gut, that doesn't take place. But when we have a damaged gut, this is what takes place. Histamine serves other purposes too. In the stomach, it stimulates production of hydrochloric acid for the preparation of digestion of carbohydrates. In the brain, it functions actually as a neurotransmitter. It regulates sleep and actually helps you get up. It's memory formation and brain arousal. So it's similar to glutamate in the brain. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter. That's why an antihistamine can help you fall asleep. It makes you drowsy because histamine is a stimulant in your brain similar to glutamate. So there are stimulatory and there are downregulatory neurotransmitters in the brain. Histamine is a stimulatory neurotransmitter. Uh, mast cells, I had already mentioned, are what secrete histamine in the presence of the, the, the need for histamine, which works on a negative feedback loop in the brain and in the stomach. It's secreted during um, um, uh, mastication. So you're chewing up food that uh, your, your talent is released um, in your mouth, and that stimulates the mast cell secretion in your stomach. Well, we always think of histamine as a bad guy, but you got to think of it as a good guy too. So don't think of anything in your body really that's created in your body as always a bad guy. It's all about balance, remember. So life is about balance. It's about having that, that, that right amount of something in your body um, at every time. And it is literally that out of balance-ness that we have that causes disease. And then you have to look at, so okay, is histamine the bad guy? We're going to take an antihistamine. Well, that might not be the right thing to do. At least at first, we need to look at what is causing this imbalance that is causing the excess histamine in my life. And that's what we want to look at. So a couple of reasons where that might be. I started down the pathway to explain one of them. It's an immune response. And one might say it's an aberrant immune response. The immune system is overactive. Um, that's the problem. Well, it's really not. It's really an, a, a correctly active immune response. The problem is, is that your immune system is firing against enemies that aren't killable. So going back to our example of a damaged gut causing peptides of proteins to get through that never should have gotten through. So we got these, these things in our bloodstream that are not broken down completely. 
our immune system is supposed to fire against enemies. So it sees that as an enemy and it's firing against that enemy. That's not an aberrant response. That's not an overactive response. That's a normal response. What's abnormal is the damaged gut wall allowed this thing to get through that never should have gotten through. So if all we're going to do is decrease my histamine response, when we decrease our histamine response, we're decreasing our immune response. So should a cancer patient take an, uh, an antihistamine drug? No, but uh, once in a while, it's fine again. Should anybody take it? You know, once in a while, it's fine, but you got to look at the reason why it's there. We don't want a chronic immune response because that's not going to be good for a cancer patient. We want a, a good, strong immune response, not this, not this light, uh, upregulated immune response that isn't really stimulating T cell production to kill cancer cells. Um, and that's what uh, uh, high histamine levels will do over time. So that's why it's important to look for the cause. So is there an, uh, an increased immune response, meaning just that chronic, slightly upregulated immune response, increasing histamine levels, then histamine itself Histamine is not a killer, so histamine is not killing bad guys. Histamine's purpose in an immune response is to increase fluid to the area in and by vasodilating the cells to increase the flow of, um, of immune system cells to the area. The problem with cancer is that, I said, some cancers can then use histamine as a fuel source. So we don't want a chronic inflammation. So that's what will be produced in this, is a chronic inflammation that is simply upregulating histamine and, and um, uh, not really giving you a T cell spike that you want to kill cancer cells. So we have to look at what's causing this. And that's where we get back to gut function. And I'm using that as an example because that is so common. Now, there can be other reasons too. A person can have chronic biotoxins. I think I've got a slide on this. I'm getting ahead of my slides here. Um, but maybe I don't. So chronic biotoxins like a chronic Lyme or a chronic Epstein-Barr or a chronic viral um, infection that is just this, this slight insidious response that um, is stimulating histamine flow can be an issue that we need to deal with that too. So damaged borders, gut border, lung border, uh, uh, blood, uh, blood-brain barrier borders can cause this. Uh, chronic infections can cause this. Uh, chronic um, toxicities can cause this, that slight chronic ramped up immune response. Um, so these are the things that we want to look at. And these are things that can be then causes for cancer and all sorts of diseases. Dietary sources of histamine can be an issue. Those, usually not so much the issue and we're going to talk about when they are, but there's histamines that are contained in foods. So we're not talking about dietary, meaning a food allergy that's causing a histamine response here because that will cause it too. But we're talking about foods that contain a lot of histamine. Cheese, eggs, nuts, fermented foods, alcohol, aged foods, kombucha, things like that are high in histamine. And when we look at your genetics that we'll look at in just a little bit, that's what we're looking for, whether a person should be eating those or not. And we'll talk about that. So trying to gain that balance, how do we do? It's really under, good to understand that when we talk about histamine, what are the things that are stimulating that histamine response? Remember, it's not so much that we're, to we're trying to get rid of histamine. It's about that you, it's a good way to think about it is that you have a bucket and you create, you know, you, you create histamine through your body, um, through different sources and you get it in your foods um, through all sorts of things more than that are on this list. And if that bucket is filled up 
and it overflows, that's when we're out of balance and it causes problems. Now that bucket is never supposed to overflow because you have a fail-safe method in your genetics. So you have a way to get rid of histamine. So just like anything else in your body, you have these metabolic pathways. You create a substance that has a purpose like histamine. It's great purpose as a neurotransmitter, as helping secrete hydrochloric acid in your stomach, as vasodilation to get an immune response to tissues, all these wonderful purposes. But then you have these genes that help get rid of it. The HNMT gene may be the more important of these. This is, a, this is a number of genes in this family, are the genes that create an enzyme. So remember, what do genes do? Most genes are the purpose is to create an enzyme. And that enzyme then acts on the local tissue or on a distant tissue, and that's how it has its function. The HNMT gene and the ABP1 family of genes create the enzyme called DAO. That DAO enzyme is what breaks down histamine. So when we look at your genes, we're looking at this right here. Actually, there's a little bit more than these, but I just took this little snippet out. So the ABP1 genes, if the person, remember if we look at genes like this person has no defect on this ABP1 gene, then on this one, they have a single allele defect. On the HNMT genes, this person is pretty toast because they have a two, 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 out of these genes, they have a number of homogeneous or double allele defects on these genes, meaning that not that the gene is not gonna work at all, but it's not gonna work quite as well as if you did not have a defect. So this particular individual with genes like this, they have a more difficult time making the DAO enzyme in the tissue, therefore they'll have a more difficult time clearing histamine from the tissue. The ABP1 gene is responsible for making the DAO enzyme mostly, mainly in the gut. So digesting the histamines that they're consuming, this person a one and a one probably doesn't have much problem with the tummy ache after they eat kombucha or a high histamine meal, but they might have problems with airborne allergies, might have problems with rashes. If they get a mosquito bite, they tend to react a little bit more. They tend to have more, um, quote unquote, um, uh, allergic type responses, maybe more stuffy noses kind of thing. Because of these defects on the HMT gene, they don't make the DAO enzyme very well in the tissue. So that's how we look at the genes when we are looking at um, the um, histamine genes. We also look at other genes like the FUT2 genes because this is really important for gut health because again, you have to go back to the, why do they have this pur purpose, this problem, their symptoms in the first place? You gotta look, you gotta continue to look deeper. It's not solely a genetic issue um, uh, of the, of the, what clears the histamine, but it can be what's causing the ramp up in the first place. So you gotta look at leaky gut issues that we discussed. Um, all these different things can increase chronic histamine levels. So that's what you're gonna look at for causes. Now, what do you do to look at for actually trying to take care of this? Well, uh, going back to, well, number one, you got to heal the gut. You know, that's why on everybody's, uh, on everybody's laptop, you got that video that you watched when you were here about healing the gut. So healing the gut is of utmost importance. Reducing inflammation, finding out what's causing the inflammation. Do I have another, a food sensitivity? Do I have a damaged gut because of chemical toxicity? Do, there's just enormous amount of different possibilities there that we want to dig into. Reduce histamine foods, especially, mainly, if you have those ABP1 defects. Now, this person, I wouldn't necessarily reduce any histamine foods, but if a person did have a lot of ABP1 defects, we would say that maybe histamine foods are not going to be your friend, and we need to reduce these right here. Um, and then using some pre and probiotics. That's why we put just about everybody on sun spectrum because I have not really met a cancer patient that has had um, maybe not twos throughout their FUT2s, but a lot of FUT2 gene defects. And the FUT2 gene is 
primarily responsible for healing the gut and creating butyrate and fueling the, the gut uh, cell regeneration. And that's exactly the, what's in the sun spectrum to help do that. Using digestive enzymes, helping uh, HCL production, helping break down carbohydrates, helping break down proteins, um, uh, supporting liver function, supporting phase 2.5, all these things that we want to do that we are doing on very many of you. And ultimately, it's for the purpose of reducing systemic inflammation. It's just this chronic insidious inflammation that causes issues. Um, that's the heart of most diseases today. So that's what we want to look at. What are some other things that are causing it? This is some things that I touched about. Um, different infections, H. pylori, Lyme disease, molds, um, uh, uh, parasites, and certainly toxicities. You can't even, if you're eating all organic, get away from a toxic exposure. Now, that's why we use some different products to reduce these things. This is the DAO enzyme itself. It doesn't get absorbed, but it helps with um, the breakdown of histamine in the gut, especially if you have ABP1 defects. And in products like histamine scavenger, curcumin boswellia, um, anti-inflammatory um, products are very beneficial. And the best stress reduction head uh, kit is just to bang your head against the wall. That's what I use. But that's the idea of looking what fills the bucket. How do we deal with that? What are the causes why the bucket is overflowing? Um, and to me, that's the best way that you could really personalize medicine. So hopefully that was a good quick overview and I didn't go too fast. I'm gonna unmute everybody. I do wanna to get to one question that somebody had. So before I open it up to questions, I'm gonna mute you again, sorry. Um, somebody had a question on Facebook, I think, or they maybe they emailed it in that they told their, I had mentioned multiple times that the majority of uh, your chemotherapy. So if a person is doing chemotherapy, the majority of the killing of the cancer is done within the first 48 hours. Um, and then you want to work at trying to pull out the chemotherapy. Um, and someone actually asked their oncologist, is that true? And the oncologist said, no, I don't believe so. I think it's constantly doing that. Um, and I do agree that with the oncologist in the sense that, yeah, I do think that if you have a poison in your body, there is going to be more killing of the cancer, you know, if you just leave the poison in the body. But I think I will stick to my guns with that the majority of the killing of the cancer is done in the first 48 hours after administration of the chemotherapy. And after that, you still may get some killing of the cancer, but you get much more destruction of healthy tissue. And so I'm still, that's just my opinion. You can decide what you want to do. But my opinion is, is that after 48 hours, you really should try to start pulling out that chemotherapy, pulling out that toxin. Now, remember, what is chemotherapy? A drug that just goes right to the cancer and kills cancer? Oh, only in our dreams. So chemotherapy is, is going to just kill cells. If chemotherapy works on the process of cell lysis. Um, and you're hoping that it's going to be uptaken by the cancer cells because they're hungrier. So, and it is. So chemotherapy is going to be uptaken by the cancer cells much more than it's going to be uptaken by healthy cells because cancer cells are hungry. I mean, literally, they are feeding more. So, uh, and that's the benefit of our chemotherapy approach. If you're doing chemotherapy, um, fasting prior to chemotherapy, um, your other cells are more stable, they're healthy, they can handle a fast, chemotherapy are starving, and they are, excuse me, your cancer cells are starving, and they want um, to, um, they, they need to feed. So they're going to just gobble up the chemotherapy as soon as they're fed anything, um, especially after a 24-hour fast. So We've gotten some really good feedback on our chemotherapy approach and how it's decreased people's symptoms. So continue to do that. Okay, now I will open it up to questions. But before I do, someone just texted or uh, chatted a question. Is grounding inhibited by wearing shoes versus barefoot? Good question. 
So I'm going to open it up and I will talk about that. So I'm unmuting it. You are not, you can, if you go outside with shoes on, you are not grounding yourself. So uh, it doesn't make any difference if you have even leather shoes on uh, versus rubber soles. Um, unless you're, unless you have enough wetness of your, if you're wearing literally worn out moccasins that they're soaked with, with wetness so that when you're touching the ground, <clears throat> you are getting some electrical conduction there. But anything other than that, I mean, if you're walking outside in Birkenstocks, you're not grounding yourself. There's too much um, interference there. There's not going to be electrical transfer of of ions between you and the ground um, unless you're barefoot. Okay, any other questions? There was another question with that one. Does sunscreen block vitamin D? Uh, does sunscreen block vitamin D? That's a good question. I think the answer is that is yes and no. So there's um, you, you're still going to get some production of vitamin D while you're wearing sunscreen, but I do think that there is some blockage. And if you, that's why if you do Google that, I think you're going to get mixed reviews on that. So I personally, I'm not a fan of sunscreen, um, but I'm also not a fan of getting burned. So does the sun cause cancer? The answer is yes and no. So if you allow your skin to get burned over and over, you, what a burn is, is it, you're, you're damaging cells. You're causing cell lysis. You're causing pathological cell death. And if you're going to continue to cause pathological cell death over and over, you're going to increase your risk for cancer. That's the problem, problem with radiation. Radiation is causing pathological cell death, and you're increasing your risk for cancer. Um, so it is with, the, with sunburns. If you just go out in the sun and you're not allowing yourself to be burned, you're not increasing your risk for cancer. Matter of fact, you're decreasing your risk for cancer. The sun is good for you. It's allowing yourself to be burned that's bad for you. So if you have skin that burns really easy, I'm still not in favor of sunscreen. If you're going to wear sunscreen, you should make your own or buy some natural sunscreen without the chemicals in it. However, you, could, you need to cover yourself up with a hat, cover yourself up with long sleeves, wear different types of clothing that will keep you cool but keep you shaded from the sun. Well, then I'm not getting the vitamin D. Well, it is. That's true. But if you burn that easy, then you're going to have to go out in shady days where you're not going to get direct sunlight and, and not get burned. I have skin where I, I think it's partly because I've kind of trained my skin a little bit, if that's, if that's proper terminology. I, ne I never wear sunscreen, but if I go somewhere in the winter from Minnesota and go down to Florida, I'm careful that I don't burn myself um, by just wearing hats or covering myself up. <laughs> Dr. Connors, this is Mike and Donna from Arkansas. We had a question. Uh-huh. Um, does time-restricted eating, um, I guess it's a two-part question. When you drink something in the morning, does that, does that upset the TRE schedule? It depends on what, the, what you're drinking. So if you're going to drink just water with some lemon in it or something like that, no. If you're drinking, um, there's even, there's even, um, so there's there's studies on this. So how you how do you know that it's interrupting the time that you restricted eating protocol? Is does it raise well, the easiest way that you could do is if you have a glucometer at home, um, a way to measure your glucose through a finger finger prick. If it doesn't raise your glucose, it's probably not interrupting your time-restricted eating. So there's argument whether even black coffee will do that. And the truth is, is that some people could drink black coffee and it 
doesn't raise their glucose, well, there's not even any sugar in my coffee. Still, it will. It can still raise your glucose because it will break down um, ultimately into glucose. So, if um, and in other people, they can drink black coffee and it doesn't. So, it, the best way to know is if you have a glucometer and you measure your glucose in the morning and let's say it's 87 and then you drink you know a, a cup of tea your favorite tea that you really like in the morning and you measure your glucose uh 20 minutes after drinking your tea and it's still at 88 or something then you're fine but if it bounced up to 102 then uh i can't have that tea very good. Uh, the second part of that question was on time restricted diet. Um, we have some friends that are on a keto diet, and they said that it ra raises alkalinity, and it can also uh, cause some kidney issues. I just wondered if you could comment on that, please. So, uh, if you're on a full ketogenic diet where you're trying to totally um, get into a ketogenic state, which by definition is, is that you are burning ketones for energy instead of glucose for energy, yes, it can put some stress on your kidneys. Um, however, currently we don't have anybody on a full ketogenic diet. Um, now, do not confuse, because ketogenic diet is really fad-like right now. So don't confuse a ketogenic diet with an Atkins diet. So people often are on, I'm not saying this about friends, but there's a lot of people that are on, a, say they're on a ketogenic diet, but it's just an excuse to eat a whole lot of meat and bacon. And it is, that can be very stressful on your kidneys. So um, that's not what we're advocating though. So um, make sure we get that straight. And I, time-restricted eating diet, um, that's not gonna increase stress on your kidneys at all, especially if you are drinking, continuing to drink water. Miss Miss Donna drinks a lot of water, and she is, we are trying the and using the time-restricted diet that you recommended. Um, will she be losing weight with this time-restricted diet? Um, it depends. So I'd suggest that if, you know, everybody's so different with this, um, but it comes, it, part of it is, stems from what your body has been used to. So for me to go on a time-restricted diet personally, it's like, uh, I already do that before they even called the thing a time-restricted diet, because I never ate breakfast and I never ate lunch. I mean, even since I was in high school, that just is how I operated. So it's, um, uh, to me, it was like, uh, well, this is too easy. Other people that are like used to eating breakfast and a snack and lunch and then a snack and dinner, and that's been their life, you know, um, up to this point, then you're going to have to make your window a little larger. So instead of, you know, shooting for a five, six to seven hour window, you might have to go to a 10 hour window to begin with and slowly work down to whatever your goal is. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Who is a good candidate for a ketogenic diet? What kind of people would, should be doing? I think surfers. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, um, from a cancer perspective, so from a non-cancer perspective, um, um, we just talked about this in the clinic. Should everybody be doing a ketogenic diet in this world? The answer is we have to take a step back first and define that. So that is a big fad right now, but I'll tell you, probably 95% of the people that are doing a ketogenic diet are not in ketosis. A true ketogenic diet is you're getting your body in ketosis, meaning you're burning ketones as opposed to glucose because you don't have any available glucose to burn. Is that the right thing to do for people? 
in uh, uh, the average? No. You, we were created to burn glucose through glycolysis into the Krebs cycle to make ATP. I don't think a ketogenic diet, I think a ketogenic diet should be, it should be used um, for the right reasons. What would be the right reason to use a ketogenic diet? Um, to help people lose weight that have had very, a big difficulty losing weight. People that are um, diabetic, ketogenic diet would be a good choice for them. They need help working through that, especially if they're on insulin and such like that. Um, type two diabetics, perfect choice for a type two diabetic. Um, and certain cancer patients, depending upon, go back and watch in the cancer gene videos, the different types of cancer. If the, if the patient has high LDH levels, and I don't want to get into explaining all what that is, but LDH is an enzyme uh, that's created by uh, a um, gene called the LDH gene that is supposed to that the purpose of that is it converts pyruvate to lactic acid. Um, so people with high LDH um, uh, levels, that's a, you can measure that on a blood test, are converting that quite readily, and that's not healthy because you'll end up with a lot of lactic acids, which will be a fuel source for cancer. Number two, if they have a, a gene called the PDH gene, which is supposed to convert pyruvate into acetyl coenzyme A, if you have defects on that gene, or if you have defects on the HIF1A gene, um, that to me, from a genetic standpoint and from a lab standpoint, is a sign that uh, we need to go on a more keto-like diet. But I use that terminology keto-like because to get a person into true ketosis is difficult. You really have to go on a three to uh, a really almost a five day water, complete water fast to get into ketosis. It's not easy. Some people, especially if you, you know, are a little bit overweight, might even have to go on a longer water fast to get into ketosis. And then to stay in ketosis, you, it's, it's difficult. Um, and I know a lot of people that are on ketogenic diets are using uh, keto sticks, which are urinary test sticks to, to measure ketone secretion. And if you're secreting ketones in your urine, oh great, I'm in ketosis. Well, that's been proven to be false. You will spill ketones in your urine long before you are really in ketosis. You have to measure blood ketone levels. So it's harder to, stick, to get into ketosis and to stay in ketosis than, than um, is often believed. So the really most people are on a keto-like diet. And I'm not knocking that, we just need to define our terms. A keto-like diet is really appropriate for most people if they're trying to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish, which is trying to, um, burn more calories, burn more efficiently, um, decrease a fuel source for cancer. Um, really, you don't need to get into full ketosis. You need to get to a keto-like diet so you're really strongly decreasing that fuel source. So um, the my piece of that is number one, we test people with kinesiology. Uh, you measure L LDH levels, you look at PDH, um, the gene, uh, uh, defects and HIF1 defects, plus defects in the KROS genes and the ME1 genes. So there's, there's multiple pathways that you look at that will suggest that a cancer is being fed through lactic acid, thereby it's being fed by, by primarily by glucose. So hopefully you could follow what I just said there. So if you don't eat breakfast or lunch, when's the first time, do you drink anything? I mean, when's the first time you actually put anything in your mouth? Are you including alcohol? Uh -uh. No, just kidding. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I don't always not eat breakfast or lunch. So sometimes if I'm home um, during the weekend, I'll eat breakfast. But it's just been personally my habit since I was in high school because I didn't have a mom, bless her soul, that made us lunches you know she said you guys make your own lunches make your own breakfast and i just didn't 
wasn't good at doing that. So um, it's, uh, I just took classes and I just didn't take a lunch in, in high school. And I just, and so that was just became my habit. So my habit became, I just, I just not hungry in the morning. And if I stay busy, I just don't think about, I don't get hungry. And then I consume 17,000 calories when I get home. So that's not good. Um, so my fast, my, uh, uh, time restricted eating had to concentrate not so much on the time that I'm restricting, but the amount of calories that I was consuming during that by feeding time. Um, so, um, yeah, I drink water. Um, and now I'm trying to get a little bit better at drinking my green drink and such during the day when I'm here. And my staff tends to remind me on that. They're a blessing to me that way. So, so you're not promoting skipping breakfast and lunch? <laughs> no, but I am promoting that it can be extremely helpful to do time-restricted eating. Now, it doesn't have to be a breakfast and lunch that you skip. It's whatever time of feeding time that is best for you. To me, it would be a lot harder for me to eat breakfast and lunch and to not eat when I get home. It's The easy part is, well, I could easily fast for for 16 hours by, um, by the time I go to bed at night and wake up in the morning and I don't eat till I get home. Well, I'm past 16 hours already. So that's a real simple thing for me to do. Other people really like breakfast and they're breakfast people and it's easy for them to skip dinner. So everybody's a little bit different that way. It's just whatever you pick your window. Yeah, I have to take medication with food every 12 hours, so I, I, the most I can ever do is 12 hours. Yeah, and that's okay, too. So that's just everybody's got to pick whatever it's going to work for them. Dr. Connors, this is Deb Sports. Not to change the subject, but go back to detox. Um, I'm, are you familiar with Sophia Health Institute? No, huh? Okay, I think they're out of Washington. Anyway, Christina Schaffner or Dr. Klinghart? Uh-huh. None of those people? Yeah, I'm familiar with them. Oh, okay. It's from those people. Um, they were in conjunction with an Italian doctor, and I'm sorry, I don't know his last name, but his first name's Marco. Anyway, he's a researcher, and he said this is no nothing new, but it, it, they found out the function of this, the interstitium, um, fluids that we have, it's, he said it was made up of a lot of tubules that help detox the body, and that um, they use as, um, what do they use, chondroitin sulfate uh -huh. to help detox your body, and it's, it was just recently discovered by him and other researchers that it, it's made up of the numerous tubules, and they drain the lymph fluids and the, um, and they, the fluids around your organs. Are you familiar with any of that? I am. Actually, that's a little bit of how you've heard of GCMAF? No. So GCMAF is a, it's got a, oh, okay. So that is a macrophage activating factor that um, got a lot of press a number of years ago as a cancer cure. Um, it was produced by a company in Great Britain that has since been shut down by the FDA of England um, because they it it's not patentable because it's a natural substance. Okay. Um, there's you can Google GCMAF and there's a bunch of information on it. Now you can't get it anywhere. So. Um, we were determined to create our own GCMAF-like substance, and um, we're actually just in the process of doing that. And it's one of the main constitutes of it is chondroitin. And the thought process is, is that chondroitin helps get the product to the cell through the extracellular spaces. So, your, your cells are, are tightly packed, right, in your body, and you have spaces in between your cells. And we talk a lot about cell membranes, and we talk a lot about lymph drainage. Well, what does your lymph drain? 
So your lymph is draining this, what is being thrown into the spaces between the cells. That's called your extracellular space. However, it's really not a, just a space. It's a matrix of proteins and tubules and waste products and garbage and, and, uh, and nutrients. So uh, your, your capillaries release nutrients into the extracellular spaces and then those nutrients and chemicals uh, go through the cell, um, attach to cell receptor sites, stimulate cell function, you know, and we've said before that it's really the, the skin of the cell or the cell membrane that is the brain of the cell because that is really what's controlling everything that's going on in the cell because it's, that's how the cell interacts with its environment. And the environment of the cell is the milieu that the cell is resting in, which is the extracellular fluid. So as the cell does things, uh, metabolizes things, and then spits its waste back through its membrane into the extracellular space, if your extracellular space is not able to drain that away, then we're going to have problems. We have waste sitting in the extracellular spaces. Um, and and that nutrients can't get to the cells. And things that you're trying to, if that cell is a cancer cell, multiple cancer cells, how are we going to get the good stuff to that cancer cells to kill it as well, right? So we don't want chronic ramped up inflammation like what we spoke about in today's um, little talk um, that is going to just gum up the whole works. So you're, the health of the lymph system is very important, and I've likened the lymph system to an open-ended capillary system, which is kind of like a storm sewer. And if you can think of the tubules in the extracellular spaces as like the streets, and the streets, if they don't have storm sewers and you have rain, well, it's just going to flood everything. Okay, so, he, was, he was also talking about how to get rid of all that, what you're talking about, through the skin. Well, you can. Your skin is a source of detoxification, but you're not going to get rid of something that's in the middle of your belly and the skin. You still need to use your lymph system. Um, the skin is going to get rid of things that are closer to it um, in proximity. And, and using that's where chondroitin and glucosamine and MSM are good anti-inflammatories. How do they work? They help kind of pave those roads. So, but you still need a good detox pathway. That's where using saunas, you're, you're basically bypassing the lymph system, but you're not gonna get the deep things using a sauna. Um, using a foot bath, you're helping bypass the lymph system. So you're, you're trying to use as many detox pathways as you can when you're getting rid of junk out of your body. Okay, are you familiar with ultrasound therapy? Because I've never heard that one either. So ultrasound therapy is just another way to use um, ultrasonic waves to move exudate or move fluid through the tissue. So we used to use ultrasound all the time um, you move the ultrasound around and it's sending these ultrasonic waves in there. And while you're moving the head of the ultrasound, it's just pushing fluid. So it's just moving fluid and moving it around. So ultrasound used to be used in chiropractic offices and physical therapy clinics, like everywhere. And then, then insurance stopped paying for it and all of a sudden all these machines just disappeared. So uh, it's unfortunate because it's a good lymph moving system. So that's what they were just trying to move the lymph to help clean things up. Well, and you're moving, you're just getting, getting the extracellular fluid moving. Ultimately, you're trying to get it to the lymph. If the person's doing saunas, you're trying to get it to, through the skin. You're trying to get rid of it. Okay, going back to histamine, all your capillaries. Histamine, does it not um, inflame the ends of your capillaries and um, decrease the exchange of all those nutrients? to your organs and stuff? Well, his, 
Histamine is, it is vasodilating. So it's going to increase the, the leakiness of your capillaries. So it's okay. going to make your capillaries more leaky. And it, that's what the purpose is. It wants to get more fluid there to bring more, more immune cells to kill an infection. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just when you have hyperhistamine levels, then that becomes a bad thing. Is that what hemangiomas are? Hemangiomas? Hemangiomas have to do with the breakage of capillaries. So partly, but you're getting more red blood cells spilling in a hemangioma. So that's even a greater amount of leakage, yes. So that's like, for me, my major thing was histamine. So that's what's happening right. with those. No, histamine is compounding it. So there's other things that, that also cause capillary fragility versus just um, capillary dilation. All right, thank you. Absolutely. All right, we're gonna have to wrap up today because um, we are way over our time. So thank you very much. This will be up on Facebook in a little bit, and we will see you guys all next week. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Connors. Oh, thank you, you bet. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.